You know, a few days ago, President Trump spoke before crowds in Poland in Krasinski Square. He said, through four decades of communist rule, Poland and other captive nations of Europe endured a brutal campaign to demolish freedom, your faith, your laws, your history, your identity. Indeed, the very essence of your culture and your humanity. He talked about Poland's communist history and how the hope of Christ overcame the darkness after John Paul, the Pope, gave his historic remarks in 1979. And then the president went on to say, they must have known during that exact moment that during Pope John Paul II's sermon, when a million Polish men, women, and children suddenly raised their voices in a single prayer. A million Polish people did not ask for wealth. They did not ask for privilege. Instead, one million Poles sang three simple words, we want God. We want God. Today, we're in a new series of messages still. It's called Soul Cravings. I hope that you will look on the back of your bulletin because you'll find an outline there to follow along. We've been talking about a variety of different things about soul cravings that we have inside us. We've talked about acceptance and belonging and value and, and uh, something greater than ourselves. And today, we're going to be talking about knowing God more deeply. Christian author and theologian J.I. Packer has written, he who often thinks of God will have a larger mind than the man who simply plods around this narrow globe. Who of us hasn't, during a time of childhood, looked up into the sky and, and seen the blueness, the blue there, and, and seen all the clouds forming different shapes and, and wondered how all that happened? Who hasn't looked up in the night sky as a child and seen all the stars up there and the moon, maybe seen a shooting star go by? And think to ourselves, how far does that go? Does it ever come to a stop? And if it does come to a stop, what's on the other side of where it stops? Now, it's hard for us to wrap our minds around that kind of thinking, isn't it? Because we're talking about infinity when we're talking about that. Something that just keeps on going. It's an amazing thing. There's something inside each one of us, deep inside of us, that has questions about how this all happened and who we are and what life is about. And it really boils down to pointing back to the thoughts that we have as children with questions like why, and how, and who. It's said that when Helen Keller first heard about God and Jesus Christ through a guy named Philip Brooks, she said this, she said, oh good, I always knew he was there, but I didn't know his name. In case you didn't realize, Helen Keller was deaf and blind and had never been taught about God before this time. But there was something inside her that sensed that there was a God who was there. Now, I would posit that even those who claim that there is no God still have this longing inside them. There's something deep inside them that says, we didn't get here by accident. It says that maybe we were brought here by aliens or, or maybe some Star Wars-like force or something bigger than themselves, something that greater than themselves, but there's still something inside them even that says there is something there. There is something there. And I believe the scriptures tell us that something is a someone and that someone is God. We're going to be looking at the book of Exodus today beginning in chapter 3. We're going to find the story of a man who probably most of us have heard of before. His name was Moses. When we start thinking about Moses in this section of scripture, we learn that he is 80 years of age. And he's been living out in a wilderness area for 40 years. Now the reason that he is there is because he has killed uh, a man for uh, killing a, or beating on a Hebrew man. He's killed an Egyptian guy. He's taken off and run away. And how did he happen to be there in Egypt in the first place? He was there because he was born there. Uh, the scriptures tell us that, that the people of Israel had been living in Egypt for about 400 years. And most of that time, they were in slavery there. Pharaoh had not known this God of Jacob. Pharaoh had not known this God of the Hebrew people. And so he began to enslave these Hebrews and have them as his workforce. And it says that over time that, that uh, there was a, a group of babies that were being born that were a threat to Pharaoh because they were populating so many places there in Egypt, the, Is the Israelite people. And so we find that, that Pharaoh says, put to death 
all the Hebrew baby boys after they're born. And so these midwives are supposed to be doing this. And we find that there's a guy named Moses that's born. This baby, as a good baby, it says in Scripture, his mother and father see him and they love him and they know he's a good child. And so they try to keep him hidden for as long as they can. But eventually the time comes where they can no longer hide him. And so they fashion this basket that looks like a little floating ark and they cover it with pitch to make it waterproof. And his mother takes him down by the, the Nile River and places him in the water and watches as the current carries that little basket with her baby son away. But he is also being carried towards the area where Pharaoh's daughter is bathing. She sees this little basket coming her way. She sees there's a baby inside. She says, this must be a Hebrew baby. She has one of her handmaidens go out and, and get that basket and bring it back. And she is thrilled with what she sees inside. She sees Moses, even though she has absolutely no idea who this baby is and who he's going to be. She still wants to keep this baby for herself, but she can't nurse it. And so she is looking for someone to nurse the baby. And, and Moses' sister says, I know somebody. It's a Hebrew woman. And it's Moses' own mother who gets the opportunity to nurse him for a while and to also teach him about who he is. The time comes where he goes to live in Pharaoh's household. He lives in the royal palace. But he kills this man one day when he's 40 years of age. And because it is learned, he takes off and goes off into the wilderness. He meets this family out there. He marries one of the daughters. And they begin to raise children. He becomes a shepherd for his father-in-law, Jethro, out in the wilderness area. And then suddenly happens, something suddenly happens that day. A uh, special day that we're going to be looking at that is going to really be a day of infamy and history. Let's take a look together at what it says here at the beginning of chapter 3. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Oreb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that through the bush, though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight why the bush does not burn up. Then the Lord saw that he had gone over to look. God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. We need to see some things about this section of scripture that are going to be moving to us. Important for us to know about how to get to know God more deeply. The first thing is we need to know that God knows us. We need to know that God knows us. Look at verse 4 again with me, if you would, please. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. God had a plan for Moses all along. God knew who Moses was from the very beginning. In verse 4, it sounds so simple, but it's so important for us to understand that God knew Moses. And it shouldn't surprise us that God knows us by name as well. God said to Jeremiah in chapter 1, verse 5, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. God formed Moses in the womb, and he knew him. God formed you and me in the womb, and he knows us as well. Before we were born, he knew what you would look like and what I would look like. He knew what we would sound like. He knew the color of our eyes. He knew our DNA code. He knew what kind of personality we would have. He knew what kinds of talents and abilities we would have. He knew our strengths. He also knew what our weaknesses would be as well. And we need to let that sink in on us. The God of the universe that put everything together, the God who made the ocean, the God who made the mountain ranges and the elements, knows us personally by name. There's not one moment when God's eye is off of you or me, and it wasn't off of Moses. Can you imagine Moses in that moment? Here's the God who has created the stars that Moses has seen out many a night as he's been taking care of the sheep. God knows the names of those stars just like Moses knows the names of his sheep, and God approaches him through this burning bush and says, Moses, Moses. He calls him by his name. You know, when you think about it, Jesus knew people by name also, didn't he? He knew a lot about people. In fact, he knew everything about people whenever he encountered them. 
It's interesting that when he first met Nathanael, uh, Jesus said that he was a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. And Nathanael was astonished by that. And he said, how do you know me? How, have we met somewhere before? How do you know who I am? They had never met before. He was astonished because Jesus knew him personally. In that moment in the life of the Samaritan woman when she went out to the well to gather water and Jesus was there and Jesus began a conversation with her, he said, go and get your husband. And she said, I have no husband. He said, you're right. You've been married five times and the, the man that you're living with right now is not your husband. And she was shocked by this. As their conversation came to a conclusion, excuse me, conclusion, uh, she went back to her, her village, and she told the people there, come see a man who has told me all about myself. They all knew about her. They would be surprised that this Hebrew guy, this Jewish guy would come along and know all about her, and so they all went out to look to see a person who could do that. In that moment in Matthew's life, when he was sitting at the tax collector's table, and Jesus came along and said, come and follow me. Jesus knew that this guy was a wealthy individual who had an empty heart. He had a full wallet, but there was something missing right inside here and right inside here. And Matthew knew it also. And when Jesus offered him the opportunity to go into something greater, then he followed Jesus and became the writer of the first book of the New Testament left behind his occupation of tax collecting and Jesus didn't care about that he said hey you come follow me I don't care what you've done I don't care where you've been you come follow me because I have something for you to do and just like so many other people today who have a lot of money but who have empty hearts Jesus knew what kind of a person Matthew was and knew his need it's that moment in life when you know that God knows you, that you can't hide. We can't hide, can we? We might try to hide. We can't do that. We can't escape. It's a moment that's both terrifying and it's comforting as well. It's unsettling and it's reassuring all at the same time. It's terrifying because you realize that you can't pretend. And we can fake people out, can't we? But we cannot fake God out. We cannot pretend around God. He knows every secret. He knows everything we've ever done. He knows every thought, every word we've ever spoken. He knows all that, and that could make us feel unbelievably uncomfortable. Sometimes when we hear our name, it's an unpleasant experience, isn't it? Whenever you were growing up and you were in trouble at home, what did your mom say to you? What, what was the name she called you? It was your complete name, wasn't it? I always heard Robert Lee Robinson Jr. You get in here. If I heard all of that, I knew I was in trouble. Chances are you had something very similar happen to you. So sometimes when we hear our name, it's an unpleasant experience. But sometimes it's a very pleasant experience, isn't it? Sometimes someone's been saying something kind about us or good about us. And sometimes it's, it's encouraging to hear when it's like that. And if God knows everything about us and is still willing to call us by the name that we go by, that is reassuring and astonishing because he could very easily say your full name and my full name because he knows what we've done doesn't he he could very easily say you're in big trouble mister or ma'am and yet he doesn't do that he knows us and calls us by name he says I know you completely I still love you I care about you so to know God more deeply we need to know that God knows us and everything about us secondly if we want to know God more deeply we need to know some things about God First thing we find is in verse 5. It says, Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. There's that hiding thing that we try to do. Moses hides his face. God, you can't see me. You know, I'm, I'm gone. I'm invisible, just like little kids do sometimes when they're trying to play peekaboo or something. But God saw him, and Moses actually knew that God saw him as well. What he finds out about God, first of all, is that God is holy. Isn't that important for us to know? God is a holy God. God says to Moses, take off your shoes for the place where you are. Standing is holy ground. When was the last time that you were so in awe of God that you felt like taking your shoes off in his presence when was the last time that you you sensed that he was so phenomenally great 
that it was just overwhelming that you almost wanted to hide because of his greatness. When was the last time that you, you sensed that you were in the presence of the creator of the universe and everything, knowing you inside and out? When was the last time you felt that? You know, when we came into this building, before we actually moved into it, before the carpet was laid down, uh, we came over from our other building, a church service over there, and we all had magic markers and permanent pens, and, and we all began to write scriptures on the floors of this building. Some of you have heard this story before. Some of you were involved in that process before. You know that back in the nursery, people were writing things about little babies and in other classrooms about little children and adults over here and educating and knowing God and on the stage about preaching the word and being faithful in season and out of season. Those words are everywhere all over the floor in this room so when you are in here you are on holy ground in essence aren't you you are in a place where God's word is and sometimes it's easy to forget that sometimes it's we walk in like we're going to the ball game or we walk in like it's just a real casual thing and there's nothing wrong with having that sense of casualness around our friends but there ought to also be some kind of expectancy that we're going to have some kind of an experience, some kind of an encounter with the living God in a place like this as well. So what we find here is that, that uh, Moses is learning some things about the presence of God. First of all, he is saying, God, I am not worthy to be around you. I want to hide myself. I have to take my shoes off. You've told me to take them off. I'll take them off. I'll hide my face because you are so great. Now, there are some people that don't feel that way. There's some people that don't want to hear about God's holiness. Just this last week, there was a guy down in Arkansas who was so upset but they, that they put up the, the new statue of the Ten Commandments that he decided he was going to take them down himself. So he got into his pickup truck and turned on his, his cell phone and got the uh, video filming thing uh, aspect of it going. And, and he began to film himself knocking down, driving into those Ten Commandments, knocking them over there in Arkansas. He'd done it once before in Oklahoma as well. Now, he's got problems, there's no doubt about it, but there are a number of people who, who kind of feel that way. They're angry at God's holiness. They don't want to be a part of God's holiness. They want to try to get rid of God's holiness in that regard, destroy reminders of his holiness. But what Moses is learning here is you cannot destroy a God like that. Moses is learning that you, you can't even get away from the presence of a God like that. You can try to take his word out, but it's going to be permanent. You can try to, try to get away, but he knows where you are. Moses hid his face because he was afraid. We can't treat God ca casually. We are casual sometimes about the worthiness of God, the holiness of God, the awesomeness of God. And God says, take me seriously. Take me seriously. I am wherever you are. In that classroom, I'm going to be there. On that sports field, I'll be there. In the office, I'll be there with you tomorrow. At home, I'll be there with you this afternoon. On the road, I'll be with you. In the locker room after the game, I'll be there with you. Everywhere God is, his holiness is present. He's also the God of the living and the dead. Look again at verse 6 with me, please. It says, then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. You know, what God is saying is, is I have a history. I have a continuity with your people. Uh, I, I, I have this relationship with your people, and it doesn't cease when they die. You know, Jesus was talking about the fact that God was the father of Abraham and Isaac, and he was explaining that, that actually that they are still alive in God's presence. And so the application to right here is that God is saying, yeah, you know them as people who walk the earth, but I know them because they're still in my presence. And friends, whenever we have a loved one who passes away in the Lord, they are in God's presence. They are still alive, they're just not physically alive but they are spiritually alive and they are in his presence so he's saying I am the God of those who have gone before you and I am still their God today I'm the God of your father I'm the God of his father the God of his father and all the way back and they are still with me today they are my people is what God calls them and look at verses 7 and 8 in just a moment. Here's where we find that God values and rescues his people. You see, Pharaoh had enslaved these people, and, and God is saying to Moses, I have seen the misery of my people. I've heard them crying out. I'm concerned about their suffering, so I have come down to rescue them. It's been going on for 400 years. 
So it's been a long time. People could have been very cynical about God's listening to them or God's concern for them. And yet God says, I've been seeing this all along. I've been waiting for this moment to rescue my people. And so he is going to explain to Moses how that's going to happen in just a moment right here. But what we find is, is that, that Moses begins asking questions that almost every person asks at some, person, or some point in their life. Does God know what I'm going through? Does God see what I'm facing? Does God really care for me? We've all asked those kinds of questions before, haven't we? Those are common to mankind. And the answer is yes. God cares. God sees what you're going through. God hears when you cry out. God cares deeply about you and me. And you know what? God often works through people who are unsuspecting individuals. Look at verse 10 with me, if you would, please. He says, so now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. You know, I have a feeling that when that day began, that Moses is thinking to himself, average day, normal day, take the sheep out, you know, spend time with the sheep, bring them back, it's going to be just a normal day. It all starts off doing that, suddenly there's this burning bush, there's an encounter with God, and still he's amazed, blah, 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 that would have been enough to write a history book about, wouldn't it, right there? But all of a sudden, he is getting enlisted into something he has no clue is going to happen to him. God says, I want you to be the one who goes back and tells Pharaoh, let my people go. What an amazing thing that would be. And isn't it true that if you look in the scriptures, almost every time you find somebody who is going to be doing something great for God, they had no clue that was going to happen, right? God suddenly approaches them through an angel or approaches them through some other kind of situation, and they are enlisted into serving God. They had no idea it was going to happen. They're unsuspecting in that regard, but God uses them and uses them in a mighty way. Maybe that's why we oftentimes don't believe he could use us, because we're unsuspecting as well. But God can use us and will use us for his will in a variety of different settings. We may not be rescuing a whole country or whole nation, but God can still use us to accomplish his will. He says to Moses at that burning bush in the wilderness, now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people out of Egypt. And Moses has a few questions about this. You can imagine that he probably would, right? His first question is, is aimed at God because he's thinking, this is beyond impossible. How am I gonna do that? And then Moses says, who am I? Who am I that I should go? And Moses has resigned himself saying, you know, I'll spend the rest of my life out here in the wilderness. All my education from Egypt, it's all in the past right now. Who cares about my diplomas on the wall? They don't matter anymore. I'm out here with a bunch of sheep. I'll be out here with a bunch of sheep for the rest of my life. Who am I, God, that you've chosen me? Forty years ago, he'd fled for his life from the courts of Pharaoh. All the thoughts of his life about being the prince of Egypt are faded memories. Maybe he might have winced when he thought about all that time he spent in the classroom and on the athletic field and all that, being trained and groomed to do something in Pharaoh's palace and household. And now he's here out here, he's kind of become a nobody in a sense. He says, who am I that I should go? And then God answers Moses with a simple question. He says, I will be with you. I will be with you. We've all bought something new, haven't we? And when we're buying it, one of the things that's presented to us is that there's a warranty with it. You know, oftentimes it's a 90-day warranty or, a, you know, something to that effect. And, and oftentimes, if it's like an appliance or something like that, the salesperson will say, would you like to buy the extended warranty with that? And we've all had that happen to us, haven't we, before? And maybe we have bought it, maybe we haven't, but usually an extended warranty is like extra money and maybe a three more years or something to that effect. But whatever warranty you have with that product, the whole contract basically says, once the warranty is done, then they're done with you. You're on your own at that point, right? You know, that's the way a warranty works. And when God is approaching Moses right here, he is saying, I've got this warranty for you, and it is a lifetime warranty. It is a warranty no matter what. I will be with you. Now, that's important. Moses needs to know that, so he checks that off his list. Okay, okay, God, here's another question for you. Searching question, he basically wants to know. He says, now, who are you? <laughs> who, who are you? Who am I going to say you are? 
Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, listen, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. They say, oh yeah? Okay, well, what's his name? Okay, you tell us what his name is and we might, we might believe you. What am I going to say? And God says to tell them, I am who I am. I am who I am. I am the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. It's interesting because Moses says, who am I? And God answers and says, this is who I am. You have am I and I am right there side by side like bookends in a way. All Moses really needs to know is that I am is with him. I am who has always existed. I am who has always been there. I am who will always be there yet in the future. What a contrast there is. Moses is saying, who am I? And God is saying, this is who I am. Isn't it true that we know deep, in down, deep down inside of us that we're supposed to believe that we can trust God, but we still worry sometimes because we feel inadequate, because we feel scared sometimes. And Moses is scared right here. He wants out. He tells God that he's never been eloquent in his speech before. He would be a terrible person to send back to Egypt to communicate uh, what he's supposed to say. And part of his problem is he doesn't want to go back to Egypt. I mean, would you want to go back to Egypt? Wanted posters all over the place. He's probably thinking every palm tree in Egypt has a wanted poster with his face on it. Every side of the pyramids have wanted posters with his face mounted on there. They used to have his picture mounted on a sphinx until the nose fell off. I mean, he's thinking, how can I go back? I'm only teasing about that part. He's thinking, how can I go back there? Because everybody is going to want me. Everybody's want, wanting to arrest me. Everybody's wanting to do something to me because of 40 years ago, I killed a guy and buried him in the sand. But God isn't deterred by Moses' lack of confidence or our lack of confidence either for that matter. He's not deterred by our sense of inadequacy in the present or our sinful past. His will and purpose for his people includes us and a task for us as well, and a presence in our lives. For Moses, God is front and center. He is about to discover that God keeps his word. Moses stood before Pharaoh when he went back and told Pharaoh what God told him to say. Pharaoh didn't want to believe it. Pharaoh said, who is this God you're talking about right here? And through a series of events, we find that, that God really began to get Pharaoh's attention. Ten plagues that came his way. And finally, on the last of the plagues, we find that the death angel was sent in. And if there wasn't blood over the doorpost of a home, the death angel would go into that home and take the life of the firstborn in that family. Did the same thing for animals, in fact. But if there was blood over that doorpost, the death angel would pass over that home and spare the lives of those inside. When the Egyptians woke up after that tenth plague, every household had someone in it that was dead. Pharaoh did too. And Pharaoh screamingly said, leave. Get out of my sight. I don't want to see you anymore. And Moses said, God was with me. God was with me. But he had to learn again pretty quickly because the people of Israel are traveling out towards the Red Sea and, and Pharaoh is scratching his head saying, how am I going to get my workforce going again? How's my economy going to stand up with all this, the loss of all those people working around here? So he says, I've got to get them all back. And so he sends his, his chariots out to get them, his army out to get them. And when the people of Israel are standing there at the Red Sea, they've got the Egyptians at their back and the water in front of them and they're wondering what's going to happen. And God says, you know that rod that out in the wilderness I told you to throw down that would turn into a snake and you pick it back up and turn back into the rod again raise it up and when he raised it up the waters of the Red Sea parted and the people of Israel went across to the other side and when Pharaoh's army started into that watery trough as well we find that the waters crashed around them killed them and that was the end of that Egyptian army God showed himself faithful God proved himself to his people all along, God kept his word, and God dealt more and more with Moses along the way. And we're going to learn how we can get to know God more deeply. It's not just through experiences. It's not just through him knowing our name. There are some other things that are important in this last part. I want to ask you to turn to chapter 33, if you would, please. 
Turn to chapter 33 of the book of Exodus, because in this chapter, we're going to find some, some time has gone by. Not a lot, but some time has gone by. And in this, we're going to discover that Moses now is with his people. They're camping out in the wilderness. And as they're camping in the wilderness, there's been this place set up each time they've stopped, and it is a special tent. It's called the Tent of Meeting. And the tent of meeting was a place designated for God and Moses to meet each other. When the people saw Moses leaving to go outside the camp to where that tent was, they would all watch attentively. They'd all stand and watch what was going on. And here we find that it says in verse 11, the Lord at this tent of the meeting would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. This is no longer... You're standing on holy ground, take your shoes off, Moses hiding his face. Now it is Moses becoming God's friend. Along the, his relationship is deepening along the way. And in verses 12 through 13, Moses says to God, If you're pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. And God answers, My presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Now that's important. There are some important things that for us to see in this session. First of all, first of all, Moses had a place where he met God. It was a place where he met God regularly. Let me ask you, what's your place to meet God? Is it just right here or is it somewhere else? I hope that you have a place in your home or a place somewhere else where you can go and you can meet with God, that you can talk with God in prayer or read scripture there. I hope it's a time where you have this, this time set aside every day or on a regular basis where you can do that, where you can pray and read his word. If you're going to grow relationship, relationally with God, you need a place where you can meet with him. And the second thing we find here is that Moses' place was outside the camp. He had a quiet place. Now, Jesus often met with his disciples away, didn't he, in a quiet place. Elijah couldn't find God in the noise of a strong wind or in the shaking of an earthquake or in a blazing fire, but he found God by hearing a still, small voice. It's hard to listen to God, isn't it, when we hear things like that going on us, around us all the time, isn't it? Isn't that kind of the way it is for us? We hear noise regularly, don't we? Listen to the music, sounds like traffic, you know, office sounds, television's on as background noise. I mean, there is sound everywhere. Listen to what God says in Psalm 46.10. Be still and know that I am God. Still and know are two words that go together in our relationship with God, don't they? Maybe for you it isn't going to be so much about a place, but maybe it's a time. Maybe you have little ones at home, and, and so it's really hard to find a quiet place. You can't do anything without them wanting to be there with you. But maybe you can wake up early in the morning or late at night. You can have this time where it's distraction-free. Recently, Tom Gaddis said there are six reasons that we need quiet. He says, number one, to get away from people. It is important, isn't it, sometimes to get away from people. Number two, to reflect upon our true spiritual condition. When we are distracted with other things going on, it's really hard to really get a real clear picture of who we are inside. Number three, to hear more clearly from God. Sometimes we don't hear from Him because we're hearing everything else. To cleanse us from a worldly mindset. If we have to constantly have something going on around us all the time, we are being caught in a worldly mindset, aren't we? We're thinking about those things, but to get away, to be in a quiet place, it drains those away from us. To soothe and calm our souls. Number six, to realign our priorities and goals. You know, Moses, excuse me, got to hear God's voice speaking to him. Chances are, you and I are not going to hear God's voice audibly, okay? I, I know there are people who say, God told me, you know, but I usually am suspicious of that when they say God told me this because it's usually not found too much in the Bible with what they're saying. Instead, I, I think that we hear God's voice in different ways. For example, uh, one way is through, through looking at his word. Look for application of the scripture to you specifically. You know, we can say God's word back to him. We can say something like this, Lord, you said you would never leave me or forsake me. 
We can tell God what he has said in his word. We find that David did that. We find that others in scripture did that. They would say God's word back to him. And we might be able to say that. Help me to sense your presence in this situation, Lord, because I feel alone. Even though you say you'll never leave me or forsake me, I feel this way. We can share that with God. It's hard to do if we have a lot of noise around us. If we're by ourselves, we can get real with God, can't we? Now let God work speak to you personally. Take a scripture like maybe Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 and put your name at the beginning of it. And like I might say, Lee, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Put your name in front of a passage of scripture like that, like it's speaking directly to you. Let God work in a time like that. They say that some of the early African converts to Christianity found time and, and eagerly participated in private devotions. It said that each person had this isolated spot in the thicket where, where he would commune with God alone. And, and after a while, you could tell where they were going to be because they were wearing a path. You, know? you, ever, you ever notice how if something's walked on a lot, especially the grass, uh, there's a path that seems to be kind of worn in that grass. And they would wear these paths that would go to the areas where they were having their quiet time. It's also said if, if one person kind of grew lax in the discipline of going out and taking that quiet time, that, that others would see the grass growing. And they would say to that person, brother, the grass grows on your path. In other words, you haven't been, haven't been with your quiet time with God lately, have you? You need to kind of restart that. How are the weeds doing in your path? How's the grass looking in your path? How are you doing in allowing God to speak to you and you to speak to him? See, Moses did what he knew God wanted him to do. Sometimes that's a rub for us, isn't it? We know what we ought to do. Sometimes we just don't do it. Sometimes we, we're unaware, but we learn, and we begin to do it, and that's wonderful, but sometimes we, we just pass on that. If you want your relationship with God to grow, you need to be obedient to his will. Remember, God is for you. I love the passage in the book of Romans where Paul wrote, if God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? If God, the God of the Bible, God, the creator of the universe, God, the father of Jesus Christ is for you, then no matter what, you have the most powerful person anywhere who says he loves you, he cares about you, he'll fight for you, he'll protect you, he'll provide for you. You are engraved, your name is engraved on the palm of his hands. He's declared you to be his family through his son. He'll take your sins and place them on Jesus Christ at the cross. He will throw them as far away as the east is from the west. He'll bury them in the deepest parts of the sea. That's the kind of God he is. And that's the kind of God that we ought to be wanting to get to know more deeply. He wants us to continually know him better and better all the time. I like it when Jesus was praying in the book of John, verse 17, or chapter 17, excuse me, verse 3, where he is talking with God, his Father in heaven. And this is what he says to him. He says, now this is eternal life, that they may know you the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. He's talking about himself there. He's saying to God, now this is eternal life, God. This Father, this is it, that they may know you, the disciples may know you, that people may know you, the only true God, and that they may know me, Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. 